This is not a view. This is not an opinion. This is not a theory. Not a theory. It is not a theory. What will be presented is not a theory, and it is not speculation. It is evidence. More than 40,000 images, hundreds of video clips, and a large volume of witness testimony. 500 pages of meticulous evidence. Dr. Beauty Wood's book has proven what happened. She does not speculate. She does not theorize. She presents the evidence of what we actually see there. It is a subject of verifiable, empirically provable, irrefutable scientific knowledge. Remember that you can know something. Not everything is a belief. Not everything is a theory. The stuff that you can actually know and use it to move forward. One thing about evidence is that it's there. It's truth. The evidence is always the truth. According to Dr. Judy Wood, the World Trade Center towers did not collapse on September 11, 2001. They were already turned to dust before a gravity-driven collapse was a possibility. Where is all the rubble? There's no debris. Where the hell did these buildings go? Yeah. You're talking about 110-story right. buildings that fucking evaporated. Where did the towers go? Go, go, go? When the towers went away, there was no S wave or P wave. It was only a surface wave. And you get that when you lift the buildings off the ground. You don't longer have that weight there. It's gone. At the bottom of the towers was something called the bathtub. If the debris of the buildings had fallen into that bathtub, it would have ruptured the walls, resulting in the entire flooding of lower Manhattan if the walls were not ruptured. These huge buildings turned to dust in midair right in front of our faces on TV. Why did so few people see that? It's incomprehensible for somebody to see something solid turn into dust. Free your mind. The dust was hitting people, and people were not burning. Obviously, the dust was not hot. Dust cloud rolls out, and it leaves behind people covered with dust, not burned bodies. Why not the trees? Why not the buildings? Why not the paper? How do you explain that? The cars burn, the paper doesn't. The alleged plane that we saw on the video went through the building like knife through hot butter, almost as if there was no resistance whatsoever. What I can say for certain is a normal airplane did not hit a normal wall. That's impossible. There were thousands, probably, of people in these buildings. Sure. Where are they? Where did they go? 
The remains of several hundred people were recovered from ground zero and ceremonially buried. But there was no trace left at all of over 1,500 who died. Remember the uh, people who left the building early? They've been referred to as jumpers. I don't think they voluntarily jumped. How many people are we talking about? About 1,200. It was raining people. It appears that there's a lot of mass coming out of the building for hours. So basically it was disintegrating from the inside. Yeah. By 5.20 p.m. there wasn't enough mass left to slam to the ground. The walls were like an empty shell. At the World Trade Center, 50 times the normal levels of tritium were discovered. It's from some kind of nuclear reaction. This is the really weird thing, isn't it? There was a big hurricane on the morning of 9-11, just off the coast. And bizarrely, it seems, no one on the news mentioned it. This was recorded in Alaska, ground-based magnetometers at six different locations. Yes. At precisely that moment, the Earth's magnetic field changed. He creates a static field. And within that static field, he interferes radio frequency signals. This interference is a different kind of physics. Well, that's an easy answer. You go to the companies that specialize in psyops and in the development of directed energy weapons. Because that is who they used. Manipulation of events on the global level in history involves the use of a controlled opposition. Steve Lee Jones was involved in cold fusion research. He comes onto the 9-11 research scene in 2005. How much clearer does it need to be? technology on this planet. With 9-11, everybody around the planet can know that free energy technology exists.
of the towers go. It's undeniable that the buildings went away. Where is all the rubble? It seems so flattened. If they had collapsed to the ground, you'd have a pile of debris that would correspond to 210-story buildings. That didn't happen. Where did the towers go? There ain't enough rubble. I mean, where are they? There's no debris. You just can't account for the missing material. Engineers at the firm that built the building's best guess to account for the missing 1,200 feet of material from each tower is that large portions simply vaporized. Now look at those pictures just hours after the event, and there was nothing there. You had a little bit of rubble, but you didn't have two 110-story buildings piled up there. That's the part that's crazy. It's just that's all that's left. People who have been right down next to the base of what was the Trade Towers say there's virtually nothing left. Maybe a few flights of stairs, a few uh, stories of one of the buildings. 110 stories at ground level. 110 stories at ground level. I've got a picture of Building 7 in the background still standing and fuming away. It went away at, at 520 that day. So we know it's before 520 on 9-11. You're looking straight over from West Street and you should see a 110-story building blocking your view. But there's just nothing there, right down to the ground. There's an ambulance that was parked in front of Tower 1 on West Street. Okay. And Tower 1's not there anymore. But the ambulance is there. That should have been obliterated too, don't you think? Why isn't the ambulance crushed? It's obvious there's a big lack of material there. The North Tower is right here. You see, you just have that shell of the facade there. And here's the South Tower is right here. And there's the center of where the South Tower stood. Where the hell did these buildings go? That's the, um, all that's standing of the Twin Towers right now in the background. That's all that's standing. That's it. That's all that's left. Every building with the WTC prefix was destroyed that day. It wasn't two towers. It wasn't three towers. It wasn't four towers. It wasn't five buildings, six buildings. It was seven buildings. Usually, mainstream, they would tell you, oh, Mel, but that's, it's just all that debris that bumped into those buildings that were in the, you know, close proximity. So they probably had structural damage and they had to be demolished. Well, then let's go see that debris that bumped into them. It, it doesn't exist. Look at WTC 6. Approximately 50% of the building's mass went away. It wasn't the outer mass. It was this hole cut in the middle. Down to ground level. There's nothing there. Some people say, well, stuff must have fallen in it. Well, debris fell in it and collapsed it down. You look in the bottom of the hole, you should see something. There wasn't much of anything left of the building. You don't see toilets, you don't see desks, you really don't see anything. Nothing that you would recognize as being part of something in an office. Aside from huge pieces of twisted steel from the towers, there was little that was recognizable in the debris. No one had ever seen anything like it. I mean, you, you didn't find a, sh a, sh a shard of glass, anything that looked like would be used by a person and you just didn't see. All there was was powdered debris and metal. We're talking here about 43,600 windows, 600,000 square feet of glass, 200,000 tons of structural steel, 5 million square feet of gypsum, 6 acres of marble, and 425,000 cubic yards of concrete turned in good part into a cloud. Perhaps the most astonishing object Shate found is something there should have been thousands of. This one probably only survived because it was in the basement. It belonged to an ice cream store. 
you can see what remains of the uh, file folders that were inside. It was the only file cabinet found. They were able to identify what store it was from, and they called up the store owner and said, hey, we got your money, and they gave them their money. When you have paper flying, but you can't see a toilet, a desk, or anything else. You have all this paper flying all over Manhattan, and yet, in the rubble, there wasn't one file cabinet wrecked or anything. I think they found one. The most amazing part of it is those two little pimples where there's an arrow that points that people survived here. And that's like right under the tower. Mickey Cross feared they would all be dead before anyone found them. I had no idea what was over us. I'm thinking 110 stories. How much rubble that is, how if they start pulling it apart, how long would it take for them to get to us? They assumed they were buried under such debris that they'd be dead by the time anyone found them. But then the strangest thing happened. This beam of sunlight came right in on us. After the dust settled, they looked up and saw blue sky. I'm like amazed now. It's <laughs> a 110 story building above us and I'm looking up at the sun. <laughs> the descriptions they gave were not of a building falling on top of them, were not of bombs exploding around them. It wasn't high heat, they didn't get cooked. They didn't get squashed. I looked up and said, guys, there used to be 106 floors above us and now I'm seeing sunshine. There's nothing above us. That big building doesn't exist. These are the biggest office buildings in the world and I didn't see one desk, one chair, one phone, nothing. There's nothing much left. There's a few beams here and there, a few columns, but it's pretty much at ground level. Where did the towers go? Where did the towers go? Where did the buildings go? Where did the towers go? Ten years you've been looking at this evidence, and you've, you've pinned it down, and you've pinned it down, and <sighs> where'd it go? of Dr. Judy Wood. For the record, I do not believe that our government is responsible for executing the events of September 11, 2001, nor do I believe that our government is not responsible for executing the events of September 11, 2001. This is not a case of belief. This is a crime that should be solved by a forensic study of the evidence. The popular chant 9-11 was an inside job is scientifically speaking no different from the chant that 19 bad guys with box cutters did it neither one is the result of a scientific investigation supported by evidence that would be admissible in court neither identifies what crime was committed or how it was committed dr judy wood earned a phd from virginia tech and is a forensic scientist and an engineer with over 35 years of experience in this very area. In the time since 9-11-01, she has applied her expertise to a forensic study of over 40,000 images, hundreds of video clips, and a large volume of witness testimony pertaining to the destruction of the World Trade Center complex. She's also the author of the book entitled, Where Did the Towers Go? the evidence of directed free energy technology on 9-11. You do not push a belief 
you basically are telling the reader to come to their own conclusion based on the evidence that you present. I don't ask anyone to believe me. I don't want them to. I want people to know it for themselves. I want people to understand what this is. And we're talking about somebody with credentials, somebody with the experience to analyze this empirically. If what she's saying is true, and I went to your website and I was blown away from day one, how in the world is it that I don't know about her? I have over 30 years of experience doing forensic engineering and science. This is what I've trained to do my whole life. I could see that something wasn't right, but nobody else could. And they were so traumatized, they had their pitchfork in hand, ready to go get the, the witch. Something about Judy Wood is that she has a tremendous moral keel that must never, I think, be forgotten. I was just doing what is honest, what's true. You see a problem, and if you don't do anything about it, that's going to sit in your conscience, isn't it? She has been rigorously excluded from the 9-11 truth movement. You're not allowed to discuss Judy Wood's research anywhere, even in truth groups, it is censored. If I'm presenting bogus stuff, why is there so much effort spent in trying to destroy me? I have seen numerous attempts to debunk this woman and they fail, and they fail because she is not dealing with anything other than what is there, right in front of our eyes. I only present evidence and the evidence speaks for itself. Dr. Wood's argument is pure science. It doesn't contain an accusation. Dr. Wood is as independent as you can be. She's just a completely, fiercely autonomous force. She's a nightmare for the control system, yes. that woman. My mother had uh, told me not to look into 9-11 because she said, if you do, you won't have a career. And I said, if I don't, nobody will. We might not even have a planet. Are you now absolutely sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that some kind of directed energy technology contributed to taking down those buildings? Beyond a shadow of a doubt. We have to see with our eyes, not with what we're told to see. I can't think of anything more important for our civilization than this. Where did the towers go? Where did the towers go? Where did the buildings go? Where did the towers go? Ten years you've been looking at this evidence and you've you've pinned it down and you've pinned it down and <sighs> where'd it go? Dust. Gone with the wind. We're talking about the fact that most people see what they expect to see, what they want to see, what they've been told to see, what conventional wisdom tells them to see, not what is right in front of them in its pristine condition. They didn't burn up, nor did they slam to the ground, but turned into dust in midair. Although they were demolished in such a way as to look as if they fell, they did not fall at all. The buildings, in fact, mostly turned to dust before they hit the ground. You see the steel falling in midair, trailing dust. It's not hitting anything as it's flying through the air. So why is it turning to powder in midair? It's not pulverization, it's not vaporization. I call it dustification. The buildings turn to dust. Dust. How could so much steel and concrete just vaporize? Did it all turn to dust? It's incomprehensible 
for somebody to see something solid turn into dust. The buildings turn to dust in midair. If you look at it, you can see that. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You have a steel beam flying through the air, and it's dissolving as it flies through the air. It's turning into dust, and it's not hitting anything. The building was not smashed to bits. So that's why pulverizing doesn't describe it. No explosions, no heat, no flames. Vaporization implies high heat. You would have seen the whole building glowing. People would have been blinded by the light. It's very dense dust. It initially blocked out all of the sunlight, 100% of the sunlight, so it was pitch black. You come to the realization that these pieces of material are becoming dust. They're frothing up into dust as they fall. And if you watch some of these pieces, you can actually see them turning to dust before they hit the ground. It turns to dust. That's amazing. That is amazing. I mean, just like a Star Trek thing. It just, poof, it's gone. What we saw and what happened on 9-11 was something that we as the public had never seen before. What happened on 9-11, I believe today it was not a controlled demolition, it was not nanothermite, and it certainly was not the pancake effect of two planes hitting a building. There's a cluster of core columns that remains here. Watch what happens to them. They just faint. Here's building seven, which is a 47-story building. It's like 650 feet tall, approximately. This has got to be over that. It physically disintegrates in front of your eyes. Not concrete, but steel. You can see all of this is frothing up into dust. And it's also blowing downward. That's about 700 feet tall. If that thing tipped over, it would take out a few blocks worth of buildings. How's it gonna go straight down? You got a 700 foot hole in the ground, drop it into? This video is a building seven. Notice this one face and one face only that has this lather pouring out of it. If that's smoke, why is it one face, one face only from ground to roof? That does not look like a fire pouring out a window. It is basically not touched at all. A few little fires in it. I mean, it, it was weird. It was bizarre. It blew out of one face of the building, one face of the building only, from bottom to top.
these windows are broken. If it was smoke from a fire and it really needed to get out, why isn't it coming out these windows? If there's a traffic jam, why does it take the path of least resistance? Notice it's spiraling around. And the wind that day was only like seven, eight miles per hour. It's not pushing out, it's being sucked out, it looks like. And that poured out of the building all afternoon for seven hours. That's a lot of material. So basically it was disintegrating from the inside. By 5.20 p.m. there wasn't enough mass left to slam to the ground. The walls were like an empty shell. I wonder how many people out there listening to us right now are just, just dumbfounded looking at each other. Here was these huge buildings that turned to dust in midair right in front of our faces on TV. Why did so few people see that? Because they were told to see a collapse, maybe? It does not fall within their learned parameters. Conventional wisdom kicks in, and it says that it's impossible to dustify a building. The buildings turn to dust before they even reach the ground. You can actually see this happening. You can watch any of the videos from the news channels. They all show the same thing. We thought we knew what we saw. A plane hitting the building should not turn the buildings into dust. We've got to start looking at this whole situation a lot differently than we have up until now. Free your mind. They just seem to crumble. This is not a theory, and it is not speculation. The proof is staring us right in our face. Can you call that a collapse? The building didn't burn up, nor did it slam to the ground, but turned into dust in midair. The 110-story tower disintegrated in just 10 seconds. It doesn't look like a controlled demolition or a pancake effect. It looks more like a total pulverization. And it just seems like it's like a waterfall effect where it's just dust is just accumulating and piling over on each other. That's not a collapse. And it's not an explosion. It's a building frothing up into powder. This is 110 stories of building turning to dust in 10 seconds. It just seems to turn into... dust. The towers did not collapse. They did not collapse. They were turned to dust. The towers were not brought down, but instead were turned into dust. We don't have a word in our vocabulary that describes that. So I've invented a new word dustification. I kind of define it as the, the process of turning a solid structure into powder in midair. Dustified. There it goes. Wait a minute. That building's turning into dust in midair. Collapses don't do that. The towers turned to dust. Uh, they turned to dust before they hit the ground, and uh, that's all I'm going to say about it. The problem that we confront is on that 
order of magnitude. It's too big for any one of us. But it is not too big for all of us working together. We stand at the dawn of an entirely new age. By all evidence, man has in his hands a method of disrupting the molecular basis for matter. Judy Wood's evidence in her case leads to one irrefutable, brilliant, clear conclusion that the 9-11 events were done by the use of free energy devices. This is the big one. Dr. Judy Wood, what she's got on the table, it's the big one. It is the big one of the last 4,000 years of history. A Copernican moment or a moment that's equivalent of the church trials of Galileo. What is being shown here is a paradigmatic change of equivalent enormity. If we can see that energy demonstrated destructively right in front of our eyes, just imagine what could be done with it if it were turned to peaceful purposes. The energy question is fundamental to everything. Once you have free energy, you can have as much clean water as you need, you can build the t as tall the buildings as you need, you can have whatever propulsion systems that you need. If we have free energy, abundant energy, for as much as anybody wants, somebody can use 10 times as much as the next person. It doesn't matter. Why fight about anything? There's no reason to even have wars. Much less have to annihilate anybody. No need for silly jobs anymore. They wouldn't be necessary. Everybody would have all the heat and cooling and fuel and light and electricity they ever needed free. So society would have this paradigm shattering shift. It will completely transform the nature of our society. It will change the whole geopolitical structure of the world. It is the single most dangerous thing to the existing status quo right. is the energy issue. It's my understanding that Nikola Tesla, 100 years ago, knew about this and knew that it could provide free energy to the world. But he also knew it could fall into the wrong hands and be used for evil purposes. So he didn't release it. Some say that all the patents and all the knowledge has disappeared. The risk that Tesla foresaw has been demonstrated. The good news in this, been there, done that. It's already been used for, for evil purposes. So why not use it for good? The risk is not there anymore. This is the moment for our civilization to claim that technology and find it and bring it out. We don't have large-scale use of free energy technology, even though we know from this evidence that it's possible. Right now, when people develop free energy technology in the secrecy of their basement, they're suicided, something happens to them. Almost universally, these devices disappear. Developing something individually, one by one in your basement, isn't going to go anywhere. A key factor in getting to the solution is 9-11. Before 2001, people believed there was free energy technology available, but didn't have the uh, conclusive evidence. It was always a vague feeling in your mind. Now, all you got to do is look at it. That's it. That's the biggest proof you're ever going to get, that it exists, and it exists on a very big scale. 9-11 proves the existence of free energy technology on this planet. 9-11 demonstrated that more clearly to more people if you study the evidence than anything else. Not many people have heard of Nikola Tesla in the wider scheme of things, but just about everyone in the world has heard of 9-11. So it's very, very dangerous to connect these ideas of 9-11 and the energy issue together and talk about the evidence which connects them. Free energy technology does exist. If that is known wide enough, everyone can develop it out in the open. Stop listening to the physicists and scientists who come out and tell us point blank in an authoritative manner that free energy physics and free energy technology is impossible. Just open your eyes and look. Look at what happened. There's no denying free energy technology exists. Due to 9-11 and due to what you have shown about 9-11, giving proof to the entire world that this energy exists, 
You've changed the odds of the game. If half the world read my book, you bet everything would change. It would undermine the power structure in all ways. We have been provided by a fuse to blow the 9-11 riddle right open so that it blows a hole in the human psyche that we can move out of psychosis into a sane way of life. And the fuse is lit and it's burning. And that fuse is the work of Dr. Judy Wood. We can live happily and fruitfully and productively, or we can destroy the planet and die. Every last one of us, along with every living being on this planet. The important thing is for us to realize we have a choice and to help others realize that choice is ours. I've never seen something so detailed in all my life. I spent like two and a half, three days reading this with my mouth open, frankly, because it is just extraordinary. What is arguably the most important book of the 21st century, Where Did the Towers Go? provides the only comprehensive scientific investigation into the events of 9-11 in the public domain. to read the book Where Did the Towers Go by Dr. Judy Wood. It's very remarkable. Anyone who's read the book knows what happened. The book is is so dangerous because it is so fundamentally based in the evidence. None of this evidence in this book has been refuted. No one has refuted anything in my book, nor can they, because it's evidence. You cannot refute evidence. Your book is written in a way where it's scientifically written, however anybody can understand it. Just look at the pictures, and it's like, you can't explain this stuff any other way. She's not discussing if it was Al-Qaeda. She does not touch that. It's analyzing the evidence. Her book has more evidence about 9-11 than anything that ever written or probably ever will be. The evidence I have collected is visual evidence. Dozens and dozens of color pictures where you can actually see what happened moments after the towers disappeared. It empowers the reader to see it and understand it for themselves. Those pictures weren't taken weeks later or months later. No, that was taken hours after. Plenty of evidence that is absolutely confirmed 10 different ways. If you look, you see. But if you listen to what they tell you, you don't see. After you read it, you'll know that what you've been told is not only a lie, but what's being fed to the truth movement is a lie. I don't come to any conclusions beyond what the evidence makes undeniable. It allows people to know once and for all what happened. Where did the towers go? 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 by Dr. Judy Wood, Ph.D. If half the world 
read my book, you bet everything would change. It would undermine the power structure in all ways. The people that are running the planet, whoever they are, they would be finished because of what's revealed in this book. If you don't have Dr. Judy Wood's book, Where Did the Towers Go? Do yourself a favor. Buy it. Read it. This is a very important truth that you need to know. Where did the towers go? Evidence of directed free energy technology on 9-11. If only a hurricane had come on 9-11. Five hundred pages of meticulous evidence. What she was doing was she was looking at the way that the dust the towers turned into was it actually floated into the upper atmosphere, and she was looking for satellite pictures of the plume. And on one of those satellite pictures, she discovered something she didn't expect to see. Looking at where the dust went up, the dust seems to, you know, fumes go up. I thought I'd get some weather satellite images. What was this I saw? There was a hurricane. I discovered this huge hurricane the size of Katrina right outside of New York City on 9-11. You know, people ask me why I have been so attracted over the years to hurricane coverage, but it, it, there's risk involved. There is, uh, you know, the peril of not knowing what's going to happen, mm -hmm. that adventure, and it's pitting yourself against an, an enemy. It's like war, only no one is shooting at you specifically. Uh, yeah, that's what the allure, but there is an area storm that I am not, that I, the juices don't flow, and you yeah. look and check it out. Look at that. And how Remember that? Wouldn't that? Oh. I watched that oh, live. I watched that live, too. <laughs> and maybe a star on YouTube. Uh, you know, you got to get up close okay? and personal. And Which, the, this was Hurricane Ike, I think. This, uh, that was recent. That was, uh, wasn't this uh, Rita? You would know. You know what I think it was, Rita? Isn't Rita it? in Galveston, Texas. Yeah, yeah. Galveston. Oh, God, and, uh, uh, you know, obviously Katrina before that changed so many of our histories. It was so, so traumatic. You know, and it's well, one funny thing I think of. I think of if only a hurricane had come on 9 11. Remember, they didn't, knew mm -hmm. how, they didn't know how to use instruments, the mm -hmm. terrorists. They, they took off in Boston, right. and they literally, after they took over the aircraft, they steered by line of sight. And it was that crystal clear yeah. September day. Sure was. Beautiful. And if it were only uh, one of these weather days, history would have been rewritten. And I think about that a lot now, and especially this time of year. So, are you we're the peak of hurricanes. Is. Yeah, you're celebrating 40 years? 40 years, days? imagine that. Isn't 40, that? Years. 40, 40 years. 40 years. And, you, know, I, you know, longevity has its own revenge. I've outlived like 15 generations of TV critics. Yeah. They all predicted I'd be done in a couple of weeks. Well, <laughs> do you still get... Everyone has those stories, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, but The tracking uh, Hurricane Aaron, I guess it's just sort of blowing out into uh, the ocean right now. It f fizzling, don't you think? It looks like it won't, uh, it, it'll just continue to uh, fizzle as it moves north. There is indeed uh, hurricane action uh, today. Here's this huge hurricane right off the coast of New York City. It is forecast, though, to continue to turn away from land. And uh, we've got, you know, we got Hurricane Aaron. This is Aaron. This is Aaron. Hey, Weller, look who's here, Mr. Peanut. And a cold front that moved through is really going to help deflect Hurricane Aaron. It is forecast to continue, though, as we said, though, to push away from land. Or they moved it and did 9-11 along with it. 
You can see on the edge of your screen here, this is the outer bands here of Hurricane Aaron. Looks dangerously close to the U.S. mainland. A lot of people, you even mention it to them, and they say, prove it. The only effect really it does have is some large uh, sea swells along the beaches. The cold front that moved through the area is going to help kind of deflect Aaron, as you see it here, more toward Nova Scotia. It's moving north. Look for riptides and heavy swells along the northeastern Atlantic coast. We're going to have just a, a beautiful day today. It is affecting the U.S. The eastern coastline in the form of some pretty large seas. And watch the posted areas if you are planning to hit the beach in the days ahead, because it could be several days that we'll have these dangerous rip currents. Tonight, under clear skies, all will be quiet. But we do have a, a hurricane that's just off the coast. And you'll see that we've got clear skies throughout much of the country. Why weren't people given a warning that there's a Hurricane Aaron there? If you look at the Hurricane Aaron data, all this talk of climate change, whether it's man-made, whether it's sunspots, you know, whether it's uh, whatever it is, you have to factor in what happened with Hurricane Aaron because that is categorically clear evidence of some type of weather control. That's another story. What this book is, is a lot of evidence of what happened. I don't have all the answers. I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I find some very interesting things. This is right outside of New York City on the morning of 9-11. It was even raining at Cape Cod. This hurricane for four days straight was going towards New York City. Most unusual to have a hurricane running perpendicular to land. They usually swoop up the East Coast. Wind speed, air pressure, and the location were pretty much constant for 24 hours surrounding the events of 9-11. If there was a hurricane, a category one, a two, how about a three, approaching your city, do you think that the media would tell you? How many people realized we had a huge hurricane right outside of New York City on 9-11? If only a hurricane had come on 9-11. There was actually a hurricane happening right outside uh, New York during the bringing down of the towers. What is that about? There was a big hurricane on the morning of 9-11, just off the coast. There's that shot from space where you see the hurricane and you see the smoke coming up out of the WTC. This was on 9-11. A hurricane such as Aaron could be so devastating to Manhattan. It would make 9-11 look like a picnic. And you could see from the data that it went in a straight line for four days. For four days, it was going straight towards Manhattan, no land masses in between. Stopped. Gorgeous weather today and for the next several days. Rain yesterday afternoon, now well offshore, just a little bit making its way off the Outer Banks. No rain today or tomorrow. Cloud cover, too, with that cold front is making its way offshore, too. So we're going to have just a, a beautiful day today. It was commented that 9-11 was a fantastic one in a thousand day, you know, beautiful clear skies, no clouds, clement conditions, you know, wonderful day. But people didn't talk about the hurricane. Take a look at the highlights for today. New York City, beautiful day here. 80 degrees today, St. Louis, 83. They had the weather forecasters on the news speaking about how sunny it was in the area. Shouldn't they say, oh, it's sunny, but there is a hurricane? Look for possible flooding in southern Texas, central and southern Florida, where the rain will be heavy. We've got four morning weather outlooks from 9-11. None of them on their weather maps show Hurricane Aaron. In fact, if you look at one of the weather maps, you can see it says rough seas on it, but it doesn't show the hurricane. Weather over Manhattan is nice as can be. But here's what should have been shown. About 10 minutes to 15 minutes before the events of 9-11 began, this is what the weather chart looked like as aired. Now I've superimposed where the hurricane should have been. This is the approximate size of the hurricane and the location at that moment. The uh, cloud cover of the outer bands of the hurricane, it was raining on Cape Cod. They're that close. 
for today. We've got uh, a lot of cool weather in the northern states. We've got some hot weather continuing in the southwest and 80s as you get into the southeast with a lot of rain, up to seven inches of rain in parts of Florida. Partly sunny in the Pacific Northwest Seattle today. Sunshine in 75. Sunny in the northeast and low humidity. Speaking of hair, what's the deal here? Some of them talk about Hurricane Aaron. ABC, for example, didn't mention Hurricane Aaron, didn't mention a hurricane at all, didn't have it on the map, didn't even talk about the cold front or discuss it. Fox News was the best, actually. We're going to have just a, a beautiful day today. This is a real cold front, folks. That means it's a boundary line of the very cool, dry air, and it is going to make its way well offshore, help to push Hurricane Aaron up to the north. It's not going to affect us at all. They mentioned it by name, but it was nothing to worry about. It's heading out of town, but they focused a lot on this high pressure system. And it was a real serious high pressure system, folks. You know, mm -hmm. and it was moving in, and it shows right where it is. For four days, it was going in a V line straight for New York City. Kind of slowed down, it kind of stalled. It pulled right up just outside New York City, like it pulled up to a chalk line and stopped at 8 a.m. on 9 11. Suddenly, it takes a sharp right turn and scoots off out into the Atlantic. Literally reported for duty, and then it went off. Approximately 500 miles in diameter, Hurricane Aaron was approximately the same size as the later Hurricane Katrina, and yet the public was not widely alerted to it. If there's a storm looming right outside of town, you should be concerned how long it's going to be there because of the storm surges. It could have flooded Manhattan. But this wasn't reported. This wasn't reported as a risk. Aaron came closest to New York City on 9-11 itself. The storm was the biggest at around 8 a.m. that morning. Not necessarily the fastest. It covered a wider area. Weather stations love to melt these things for all they can get. That would be huge news. That would be all over the radio and TV all morning long. Don't you want to tell people they might need to evacuate just in case? It was so played down that nobody knows that there's a hurricane there. Curiously, they had scientists from 10 different universities actually doing measurements on Hurricane Aaron. If you look at the speed of the hurricane, the uh, pressure of the eye of the hurricane, and its location, for about 24 hours, 12 hours at either side of the events of 9-11, it's constant. It's like a very controlled environment. On this Tuesday, the night of the Latin Grammys, sunny skies down through Texas, uh, all the way from the bottom of Texas to the top of North Dakota, little rain to the right of North Dakota, parts of North Dakota may see a little rain. To the west of the country, no problem. To the east in the country, uh, no problems except down in Florida, a little rain. Northeast, we'll see uh, little rough seas along the New England coastline from that hurricane that's going away. Miles and miles of sunshine. Miles Davis, we're going to put miles out there today, nice as it can be across the Northeast. Uh, rough seas still. Uh, from, the, uh, from the chop from that hurricane, but other than that, it's kind of quiet around the country. We like quiet. It's quiet. It's too quiet. Too quiet. Too quiet. Too quiet. Too quiet. I want to show you, though, just to the east of New York, what our satellites were picking up September 11th, 2001. That is Hurricane Aaron. At the time, it was a Category 1 hurricane. And if we look at what was happening just about 400 miles to the west of there in lower Manhattan, this is from our MODA satellite from NASA. And you can actually, if you look very closely there in lower Manhattan, you can see the smoke coming down uh, from the Twin Towers there on September 11th, that very brisk northerly flow. A cold front had moved through and deflected this hurricane from threatening, or at least getting to New York City, but you can still see the smoke there on our satellite. An incredible picture there, uh, there in New York. So you have two possible reasons for it being there. One is it was a coincidence, or it did have something to do with it. What tells me that this was controlled was that there was no concern about how long that storm was going to stall out there. How could they be that sure of exactly when the hurricane was going to leave? Nobody knows about this. Nobody knows about this hurricane. Why weren't people given a warning unless, unless they were so sure, 100% sure, of what that hurricane was going to do.
combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silent, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. Good morning. My name is Frank Culbertson. I've been fortunate enough to be uh, an astronaut on three missions to space. So on the morning of uh, September the 11th, 2001, I called the ground and uh, my flight surgeon, uh, Steve Hart, came on and uh, I said, Hey, Steve, how's it going? He said, Well, Frank, we're not having a very good day down here on Earth. Um, and he began to describe to me what was happening in New York the airplanes that were flown into the World Trade Center, the airplane that was flown into the Pentagon. As we were talking, I saw that we were coming across southern Canada. I found a video camera and a window facing in the right direction. Got in the window and looking out the window uh, from over Maine, about 400 miles away from New York City, uh, I could clearly see the city. It was a perfect weather day all over the United States. And uh, the only activity I could see was this big black column of smoke coming out of New York City, out over Long Island and over the Atlantic. And as I zoomed in with the video camera, I saw this big gray blob basically enveloping uh, the southern part of Manhattan. And what I was seeing was a second tower come down. And we had 90 minutes to get set up for the next pass across the United States. So we set up every camera we could, looking through windows facing downward. And I said, guys, we're going to take pictures of everything we can see as we come across the U.S. So every orbit, uh, we kept trying to f see more of what was happening. Long a staple of space missions, took on new poignancy in mid-September when Culbertson and his crewmates viewed the plumes of smoke rising from New York City shortly after the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center. As we went over Maine, we could see New York City and the smoke from the fires. Our prayers and thoughts go out to all the people there and uh, everywhere else here. I'm looking up and down the East Coast to see if I can see anything else and um, to the people in Washington. And Frank, that's an accurate assessment. And I hope that the people responsible are caught and brought to justice as soon as possible. But first, our prayers and condolences to all involved. And um, I just wanted the folks to, to know that their city still looks very beautiful from space. I know it's very difficult. This is the morning of 9-11 where you're saying this. And he doesn't notice that he has to aim his camera to avoid the bands of the hurricane? For New Yorkers, your city still looks great from up here. Mm. Television is not the truth. Television is a goddamn amusement park. This is mass madness, you maniacs. Turn off your television sets. Turn them off now. Turn them off right now. Turn them off and leave them off. Turn them off right in the middle of a sentence I'm speaking to you now. Turn them off. Scientific dictatorship straight ahead. Rise and shine, sleepyhead. It's after eight, you're late. Get out of bed. This is a bucket of water on your head. You're asleep. You might as well be dead. Thanks for calling. Check the 
Dust in midair, midair, midair.